Please take a seat. We've been working through our series in Leviticus and I've been given the privilege of delivering the very last sermon and primarily what we've been doing previously in our series is we've been thinking about redemption, the way that what Leviticus teaches about sacrifice and priesthood points forward to the work of Christ. Today we're not going to think about redemption, we're actually going to think about ethics. We're going to think about our response to redemption. We're going to think about our need to keep the commandments. Um, So I'm going to pray for us. We're going to need some help. And then we'll spend some time looking at chapters 18 and 19 of Leviticus. Um, Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that every word in your book is for our benefit. It's good. Uh, We thank you that your word is sweeter than honey. And so we pray that you may help us to taste the sweetness of your word and that you might give us the strength and the motivation that we need to be people that live in light of it. Amen. Some years ago, I was staying with a friend, and, and on the night that I was staying with my friend, he actually had to, to go out of the house and uh, do some things that night. I can't remember what it was. Uh, but he said, make yourself at home. Uh, the fridge is over there. Help yourself to whatever you can find. So that night, I found some leftovers at the back of the fridge, and I got stuck into them. But I didn't think uh, to think that maybe they'd been there for quite some time. And, and later on, I found out how long they had been there. Uh, I was so sick, um, and they were definitely um, out of date. Now, some people claim that the teaching of the Bible is out of date, that no good can come from following ethical demands of books like Leviticus. They say, how can a piece of legislation written thousands of years ago still have anything relevant to say to us today? That was an ancient world back then, but this is the 21st century. We've moved on. Get with the times, they say. We've been looking at uh, the doctrine of redemption in Leviticus, but today we're going to be thinking about the ethics, the ethical demands of Leviticus, its moral imperatives, its commands. And we're asking the question, do the commands still apply to us? Is what God commanded the people of Israel binding on us? Is there an expectation that we keep the law Or has it been superseded by Christ? Could it be that there are some parts that still apply to us and while there are other parts that don't? And then that leaves us with the question, how do we know which is which? Well, these are important questions for us to ask if we want to live hearty Christian lives. And to be able to answer these questions, we need to to understand three things. Uh, Firstly, we need to understand the context of these commands. Secondly, we need to understand where the commands come from. Are they just cultural or are they in some way universal? They've they've got a foundation that runs deep. And what is their purpose? What does God want to achieve through giving them? Well, let's think about the context of of these commands. And and what we're going to do is we're going to look at the book of Leviticus as a whole. Uh, You can break Leviticus into two halves, a bit like you can crack an egg. Uh, Chapters 1 to 16 is predominantly about redemption and chapters 17 to 27 is predominantly although not exclusively about ethics and today we're going to zero in on chapters 18 to 19 but it's important that we stand back and we have a look at the whole because when we have a look at the whole we actually see that ethics always comes after redemption that's really important You see, 1 to 16 has been working on this idea that we're a fallen people in a fallen world and we're inevitably unclean. The only way that we can approach a holy God without his wrath breaking out against us is if there is some kind of mediator that can atone for our sin. 1 to 16 teaches us that we need a priest who will sacrifice on our behalf. It teaches us that there can be no access to God without atonement. And as we've looked at these things, uh, the the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ has shined in all of its brilliance because we see that Christ is our great high priest, the one who bridges the distance between us and God by offering himself in our place, turning away the wrath of God and cleansing us from every guilty stain. So as we think about how Leviticus applies to us today, 
and whether we're meant to keep these commands, understanding that 1 to 16 is about redemption, and 17 to 27, it's really important. It's really helpful in two ways. Uh, first of all, it reminds us that we don't have to keep those parts of the law that have been fulfilled in Christ. We don't need to construct some kind of priesthood or offer any kind of sacrifice because the perfect priest has come and he's offered the perfect sacrifice. Those ceremonial parts of Leviticus, those cultic and ritualistic parts, those bits that speak about redemption or our need of it, we don't keep them because Christ has fulfilled them, but we certainly learn from them. And the second thing we, we learn in considering the context of Leviticus is that ethics always happens in the context of grace. We don't seek to be God's holy people so that we might be redeemed, but because we have been redeemed. We don't keep the commandments to enter the kingdom of God. They're our loving response because we've already entered. So we've looked at the, the, the context of the commandments. Redemption always comes before ethics. Where do these commandments come from? Are they just a reflection of the culture at the time? Or maybe even a reaction against the culture? Or are the commands universal in nature? Do, do they have a foundation that runs deep? Well, we're going to pick up chapter uh, 18, verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not follow their statutes. My ordinances you shall observe, and my statutes you shall keep, following them. I am the Lord your God. In chapter 18, when we come to that phrase, I am the Lord uh, your God, it's actually a kind of shorthand uh, way of speaking about this idea of redemption. Uh, every time we see it come up in the Pentateuch, it's, it's actually referring to something that has happened before. And perhaps the clearest statement of what it's referring to, we, we find in Exodus chapter 6, where God is speaking to Moses and he says, I am the Lord and will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. That's redemption. I will take you as my own people and I'll be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. So whenever the people of Israel see this phrase come up, I am the Lord your God, it reminds them that they've been purchased, they've been redeemed, that they're not their own but they belong heart and soul, body and mind to God. They're his people. And as his people, they're not to live like the Egyptians, the land they came from, and they're not to live like the Canaanites where they would go, but they're to live as God's people. And what will be the distinctive thing that sets God's people apart from all the people around them? Well, it will be their obedience to his commands, their following of his law. Now you'll notice if you, if you run your eyes down at chapter 18 and chapter 19 that there seems to be no area of Israelite life that God is not concerned about. His rule is comprehensive. He's just as concerned about what happens in the marketplace as what happens on the farm, as to what happens in the family home and behind closed doors. His commands, they seem to cover everything from sex to greed to generosity to concern for the poor and needy. He speaks about stealing and lying and the kind of things that come out of our mouths. He talks about injustice and revenge and hatred and love. It's not just the things on the outside, but there's matters of the heart. And it even seems to govern ceremony and worship and faith. Perhaps we could, we could say that what God wants for his people could be summarized by Paul's phrase in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. You are not your own, but you were purchased at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Um, so let's just hit uh, pause for a minute and slow down and have a think about what could this mean for us? What can we take away from this thinking about commandments? 
Well, the commandments, they help us to see that God wants our whole life. He wants our complete devotion. He doesn't want some of our devotion some of the time. He wants us to be people that are all in. We are not our own. We were purchased at a very great price, the price of God's own son. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. You see, the teaching we sit under is the teaching that the people of Israel sat under. It's the same logic. But not everyone can accept this. It won't surprise you to hear that not everyone accepts that Leviticus still applies to us today. Uh, there are some people out there who, who want to reject the book of Leviticus because they claim that its ethics are draconian. Uh, they'll say it's a, a valuable piece of history. Uh, it speaks about the, the people of Israel and, and what it was like for them as they were making their journey towards the promised land from a historical point of view. Very, very valuable. But in terms of a moral foundation that we build our lives on, you've got to be kidding. And then there are others who are perhaps a, a little more generous in their assessment of, of Leviticus. They don't want to throw the whole book out. But there are certain ideas that they want to reject. There are hard teachings that they are unwilling to accept that, that cut against the grain of our modern society. And so they'd like to take some of these ideas over, over here but leave some of these ones that are a little harder to live with. Uh, and the most common argument uh, for people treating Leviticus like this uh, runs something like this. It, it's not the only argument, but it's probably one of the most common arguments. The reason God made these laws was that the surrounding nations had some very dark and very sinister ways of living, and God didn't want his people to adopt them. What they are saying is that the commands in question were written to address particular cultural issues of the time and they were never meant to be given a wider application. That once those laws had fulfilled their purpose in that time, that, that was to be the end of them. That was then and this is now and we live in a different time and we're a different group of people and perhaps we're not even as pagan as they were back then. So the argument goes that the commandments must simply be out of date, no longer relevant for modern day society. Well, it's at moments like this we actually we need to slow down and we need to think very carefully. Uh, these are important questions and this is an important argument that's being made. Uh, so let's think through whether there's any basis of dismissing Leviticus out of the Bible or even some of its truths. Uh, well, first of all, we want to acknowledge that there is some truth to that argument. Uh, that God did not want his people to be like the nations around them, and, and the nations around them did have some very dark practices. God did not want that for his people. But is that the reason that God gives the law in Leviticus? Well, certainly he wants to warn his people from going there. But is that the primary motivation could it be that, that God actually gives the law to his people because he wants them to be like him? It's not so much that he doesn't want them to be like the, people, the nations around them, but he primarily wants them to be like he is. And we actually see that in chapter 19. The Lord spoke to Moses, chapter 19, verse 1, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. If God wants his people to be holy, then the commandments that he give must be holy, like he too is holy. Um, think about it with me like this. If you were to, to hold up a, a mirror in front of God that could reveal to you his character, what would you see? Well, you'd see the things that he loves, the things that he values and treasures, and you'd also see the things that he hates, the things that he cannot endorse and will not tolerate, the things that he must oppose and stand against because they bring disorder and destruction into his world. In practical terms, as you look into this mirror and you see this reflection of God's character, what would you see? You'd see the commandments because the commandments always express the things that God values and they always express the things that he cannot tolerate. 
And God wants us to be like him. He wants us to be holy like he is holy. So he wants us to adopt the things that he values by taking seriously his commands. What this means is that there are no grounds for us to dismiss the, the commandments that are moral in nature. Are these commandments that may be spoken to a certain time and a certain place and to even a certain set of circumstances, but their application will always be universal in its nature because it flows from the character of God. We may need to consider the intention that God had in mind as he gave these commandments. We may need to consider the context of what is going on. We may need to consider if it's been fulfilled in Christ. And we might even need to look wider in the Bible to see if it actually helps us to understand these things. But these commandments will still be universal in nature because they flow from the character of God. God's moral commandments, uh, as different from those ceremonial commandments that have been fulfilled and those civic commandments which speak about living in the land of Canaan, God's moral commandments will never go out of date because God doesn't change. He's holy. He's immutable. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. He, he doesn't make mistakes. He is entirely consistent from one generation to the next generation. He's not like you and I, always changing our minds about what we love and what we hate. He, he wouldn't give one set of values to, to one group of people and then somewhere down the track give a completely opposite set of values. The things that he has commanded, they will always be relevant to us. And I actually think this is immensely reassuring for us because we, we live in a world where there is so much confusion about what's right and wrong. One person says that this is a loving thing. And then another person comes along and says, how could you do that? There's nothing loving about what you have done. And we're confused about what is right and wrong and about where truth comes from. But God has not left us in confusion about what he values, about what he treasures, about what is good and about what we must stay away from because it brings disorder and chaos into the world. The commandments are actually immensely reassuring because they reveal to us the character of God. So uh, let's uh, just have a think about where we've been. Uh, we've seen that, that, first of all, holy living is always a response to grace. We've seen that the commandments will always apply to us because they flow from the character of God. Uh, but there's one more piece of the puzzle that we need to put into place. We need to understand what are the purpose of the commands. And you actually see that the commandments have different purposes um, in Leviticus 18 and 19. So some commandments are there to teach us. They're didactic. And some commandments are there to help us to relate well to one another and to God. The didactic commandments, the teaching commandments, well, most of 1 to 16 would fit into that category. Uh, that ceremonial things about redemption that have been fulfilled in Christ. We, we don't offer sacrifices, but we learn from those commandments about where redemption is found. But there are also other commandments uh, in Leviticus that, that are really strange. And, and maybe you have your favorite uh, strange commandments. Um, but understanding these commandments as teaching commandments helps us. Um, so let me give you an example. Leviticus 19.19 19, You shall not let your animals breed with a different kind. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed. Nor shall you put on a garment made of two different materials. Very strange, isn't it? And uh, opponents of the Bible often come to verses like this and they, they say, well, you're quite happy to say that this is immoral and that's immoral, but you, you walk down the street in your, your polyester jacket, eating a hand sandwich on the way to get a tattoo, and you don't seem at all concerned about keeping those commandments. You are so inconsistent. But God is never inconsistent. You see, there are two different types of commandments. One commandment, it's there to teach us. And what does this very strange commandment teach us? Well, it teaches us that God will always be opposed to things that remind us of the fall. God will never be a God that endorses the unnatural. 
like the mating of two different animals. And God will never be a God who endorses disorder and confusion, like the planting of two different crops in the same paddock. And God will never be a God that allows the holy and the unholy to live together, like two different types of thread. They're there to teach us about the character of God, strange as they are. But God is not inconsistent. So he gives us these commandments that that teach us about himself, teach us about us, teach us about redemption. But he also gives us commandments that are relational. And I imagine as we we read through most of chapter 19, a lot of that made sense to you. You went, yeah, of course. And not stealing, not lying, not deceiving one another, not taking revenge. Those things are good because they actually help us to relate well to one another. Loving our neighbours as ourselves, which it's there in, in chapter 19, verse 18, that's actually a really helpful thing to do if we want to relate well to one another and we want to relate well to God. You see, in a, in a fallen world, the most natural course of actions are, are for relationships to be fractured, for there to be tensions, for selfishness to triumph over love. But these relational commandments that God gives actually help us to live in the world in a way that reflects what it should have been like before the fall. Uh, We'll struggle with this. Uh, We're fallen people. We won't get it perfect. But it's our response to the redemption that we've received uh, to live as if we're in a pre-fallen world. Uh, One of the arguments that that I think I feel in my own heart, and I don't don't know if you feel this too, is is I really love Matthew 22 and, and where Jesus says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. I think to myself, I can handle that. I don't have to worry about all of these other strange stipulations and decrees. And I tend to think to myself, well, I don't need any law to tell me what love looks like. It, it's common sense. It's, it's natural. It'll just flow out of my heart. But could it be that the reason that Jesus actually is quoting Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18 when he he speaks about these things loving God, loving our neighbour is that he wants us to go back to books of the Bible like Leviticus to think about what true love looks like could it be that he didn't want us to dismiss the ethical teachings of the Bible because we think that our common sense is so much better could it be that he didn't want us to claim that, that love will be something that's just natural to us and And we'll know what it should look like in practice all of the time because we're so wise. Now, could it be that he actually wanted us to go back to the place where he drew these commandments from and reflect upon their teaching so that we might get a fuller picture of what love looks like? For as we go back and we reflect upon these things, we'll actually find ourselves reflecting on the character of God, the things that he values and the things that he hates. And there we will have our clearest picture of what genuine love looks like. We live in a world where where people, they they love to to label things and, and, and some people will say that the Bible is poison and some people will say that books like Leviticus, they're like food that's gone out of date. They'll make you sick. You won't be able to stomach them. But I hope that as we've gone through this series in Leviticus that, that you've actually come to see that God's word is good and that what God commands it will always be good because it will always be a reflection of his character God will never endorse sin he will never ask us to do anything that will bring destruction and disorder and chaos into our relationships and in this world the life to live the best life to live the good life to live will always be a life of obedience That won't necessarily be the easiest life. It won't necessarily be the most popular life. And it won't always mean that we're successful at doing it. We're fallen. We sin. We make mistakes. But if we turn back to the book of Leviticus, we'll get help to do it. And when we fail, we'll be pointed towards a redeemer who's bridged the distance between us and God, the Lord Jesus. And we'll be pointed towards the work of the Spirit that writes God's law in our hearts. So let's not run away from books like Leviticus. 
but let's spend time reflecting upon them. Because at the very heart of them are the two things that we need to think through all of the time. Redemption and ethics. So we remember, you are not your own, but you were bought with a price. Therefore, honour God with your body. Uh, I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to spend some time uh, listening um, to some music and reflecting upon these things. And our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us the book of Leviticus. Um, we know that it's not the first book that we often turn to when we struggle in our relationship with you and when we struggle to relate well to one another. Uh, but we pray, Heavenly Father, uh, that you might help us to see that this is actually a book that we can turn to, that does help us, uh, that does give us a, the kind of information that we need. Uh, to understand what you've done through the person of Jesus and what you're doing in us as we seek to live for you. Uh, so please keep changing us and shaping us by your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.